It's my pleasure to introduce Sean Yom. Sean uh, is a professor at Temple University where he focuses on political science and comparative politics. Uh, Sean is also an associate scholar with FPRI, which I'm happy to report, as actually are many of our speakers in today's weekend. Um, Sean has uh, done a lot of research in country in Jordan and research and published a lot of articles on the topic. Um, and, and also some uh, topics in Morocco and the greater North Africa. His work focuses on authoritarianism and state building and political order in the post-colonial Middle East. Uh, he publishes uh, frequently in a number of journals, including the Journal of Democracy, and is currently working uh, on a book on authoritarianism. Finishing. Oh, finishing, finishing the book, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, he received his PhD from Harvard University and uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford. So let us welcome Sean. Thank you very much. Is, I'm sorry, is this on? This is on. Great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for having me. I know I am the last speaker of a very exhaustive two-day workshop. So to not waste any time, does democracy have a future in the Middle East, which is the title of my presentation, and something I hope to didactically speak on today, Yes, thank you, and good day. No, um, <laughs> I, you know, like all things in this region, uh, the answer is always going to be qualified, and it's going to be ensconced in historical context. And what I hope to do today is explain what, my particular interpretation of that question and hope to deliver some key insights, both from history's infinite comparative database as well as from political science and other theoretical insights to, to deliver, I think, a couple of key points that hopefully will, I think, broaden the understanding of what democracy means as a concept, two, what does it historically mean in the Middle East, and three, how do we conceptualize and theorize the question, the question of does a concept like democracy have an institutional or structural or cultural future um, in the region? So my presentation will be structured in three sections. The first section will be defining democracy and understanding the so-called deficit of democracy in the Middle East uh, more clearly. Obviously, when we ask questions, and this has, of course, been on the news uh, a lot in the last few years, especially with the Arab uprisings, and particularly after 9-11, uh, there were several years under the Bush administration where this, this was a key topic of our foreign policy establishment about democracy in the region. There's obviously an assumption that if you have to ask the question, is demo, you know, what is the future of democracy in the Middle East, then that begs the assumption that it certainly hasn't been part of it in the past. Right? And, that's this, and that's a critical, I think, historical assumption that should be contextualized against world trends. The second section, I want to go, I want to uh, more mechanically link the past to the future and explain, I think, or, or ask the question, do previous explanations for the historical absence of democracy in the Arab world, um, do they have relevance in the coming years? In other words, can we leverage what we know about the absence of democracy in the Middle East since, say, the 1970s to project uh, particular outcomes about these states in the future? And finally, and I think this is going to be a question that certainly is, you know, comes across in many classrooms. Um, at Temple University, I teach the sort of the, the main sequence of Middle East politics classes in the political science department. I teach at the undergraduate and the graduate levels. And even if you go an entire semester without mentioning the U.S. or America in some non, sort of non-parochial um, form, the question always comes up, so what can the U.S. do about it? Right? And what can the U.S. not do about it? And what I want to argue today is that when we ask questions about promoting democracy, what do the views of the U.S. have any weight as to the future of democracy in the Middle East, the answer, again, is a qualified yes. It's not as much as many people think, but certainly not nothing at all. I think one way to start building up our concept of democracy, and this comes from my own training in political science, is to build a concept uh, from, uh, it's, I'm sorry, I should say from thin to thick. It's a brief spelling error. Uh, going from a thin concept of democracy, which is to say a minimal institutional definition, to the thicker version that we often hear about um, in public discourse. So one way to approach this concept when we ask questions about democracy in any region is, what is the necessary condition that has to exist 
for a government to call itself a democracy. The absence of that condition renders that government undemocratic. At base would be free, competitive, and regular elections for offices of power. No free elections, no democracy. This is a non-negotiable. This is inscribed into the institutional heart of the concept and something that all regimes have to have to, put, to, to, to frame themselves as democratic. As we move up the ladder of conceptual thickness, however, then we start, getting, uh, we start moving away from electoral definitions and more into normative and liberal definitions. And these are the things that we typically associate with Western democracies, such as constitutional rule of law, legislative checks on executive power, an independent judiciary, and no unelected tutelary authorities, whether they wear the cloak of clergies or the military uniforms of generals. You cannot have unelected tutelary authorities that lord over a constitutional or institutional system and can single-handedly veto, or in some more egregious cases, dictate policy from above. As we move up, we get into even more, we get into more liberal, liberal dimensions of democracy as a concept. Uh, liberal democracies, at minimum, have to have broadly protected individual liberties for citizens, including those that we associate with our own First Amendment expression, assembly, speech, petition, um, and religion. As we move up, then we get to broad-scale social protections, a vibrant civil society full of voluntary associations and independent media sector and other uh, organizations, and legal protection for cultural, ethnic, religious minorities, and gender equality in principle. And finally, if we get to the thickest and most liberal definition of democracy, we would talk about a responsive state that can comprehensively respond to, to, to citizen needs uh, when they want something done. A responsible state, a responsive state, a social life which is deemed fair by most people in terms of opportunity and treatment, and most people have some sense of dignity. So when we talk about democracy in the Middle East, right, we we're beginning with a very minimalist conception at the bottom. Very few of us, when we read the news, or at least I as a scholar, when I hear pundits say, well, can democracy thrive in Egypt? They're not saying, well, you know, what is it going to take for, say, social life to have fairness in Cairo? What they're really saying at minimum is, will the next elections be free and fair? So how you use the term democracy Right, we'll, 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 we'll hinge upon what level of conceptualization you pick. And my recommendation, this is why I do in my classes, and especially my scholarship, is to pick the most minimalist institutional definition such that you get to a non-negotiable. If you don't have it, you don't have democracy. Once you get it, then you can talk about what kind of democracy you have. And that brings us to the electoral um, dimension. So if we want to talk about democratization then, as the changing of a government from one regime type to another, from authoritarianism to democratization, we need some portable principles. In my view, right, democratization requires, therefore, those, those elections determined by nonviolent means whose outcomes cannot be dictated ex ante. As a, one very well-known political scientist named Adam Jaworski wrote, in other words, democracy is institutionalized uncertainty. You do not necessarily know who will win any given election, although you can certainly predict or project, and the losers of the elections have to accept the outcome. Another popular definition of democracy is a political system where parties lose and have to accept it. Right? And of course, as I explained earlier, if you want to go from this minimalist conception to a thicker one, then you talk about all the other protections, which I think complicates things across cases, across cultures, across regions, and this is why I always stick to the basic institutional core of the regime. So inversely, when we talk about democratization and democracy in places like Egypt and Tunisia, Libya, Syria, Bahrain, and so forth, we often connote that democracy would be something distinctively different from the previous regime, right? Such a system of democracy would ostensibly replace authoritarianism, which is distinguished by a couple of key traits. Predictable distributions of power, meaning elections are uncompetitive or non-existent. In Syria, for instance, there are publicitary exercises. Um, in, other, in, in, in somewhat less authoritarian states, they're somewhat competitive, but the outcomes are still inscribed uh, you know, well, into, you know, well before um, they actually happen. There is limited pluralism within state and society, such that opposition and civil society cannot operate freely, 
and most of all, this is what we associate, most of us associate with instantly with dictatorship, an omnipresent threat of repression that enforces limitations on basic freedoms, civil society, and minority classes. Right? So the idea of democracy is to replace such a system with, at minimum, a political order that revolves around the circulation of power through, fear, through, through free, fair, and uh, regular elections between competitors. So clearly, questions we ask about the Middle East assume that the region doesn't have a lot of that kind of political order, which is true in historical perspective, but not necessarily in ancient or, should I say, in sort of millennial perspective. Right? It is well known, I think, among most scholars of the region that the Middle East is hardly an incubator for liberal democracy. Like that, we know. But neither have most other regions of the world since the last quarter of the 20th century, until what we call the third wave of democracy started in the early 1970s, ended in the late 1990s. The third wave of democracy was one of the most unprecedented transformations of regimes around the world. It involved democratic transitions in 60 countries, it included almost every region except the Middle East and North Africa. Right? To give you an idea of how much this particular cluster of decades changed all regions or most regions, consider Freedom House scores. Freedom House is a, the, the, the Freedom House uh, Freedom in the World Index is a quantitative measure of democracy. It's not perfect like all numeric things. It's far less precise than the interval values suggest, but nonetheless, it provides a crude measure of a democratic regime, right? And without going into the many indicators they use, in general, for aggregate scores, if you look at this database, which is free online, freedomhouse.org, then the, the, the lower the number, the more democratic the regime. Um, for the most part, 2.5 in their index means a democracy if you combine all the scores. So what do we know? Since the last quarter of the 20th century, the US has been fairly democratic, right? India has been a, a bit less liberal, but for the most part democratic. Spain had its transition from a military dictatorship in the late 1970s with the end of the Francoist regime. Brazil and its bureaucratic authoritarian junta regime in the mid 1980s. South Africa entered the ranks of, the South, of, 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 of electoral democracies with the end of apartheid in the early 1990s. China, of course, is the largest country, as well as the, uh, the, large, the single largest country in the world, and also uh, the single largest authoritarian country in the world. And finally, just three examples from the Middle East and North Africa, Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. Their scores don't change. Right? If you look at these indices, and there are others just like these, you can see which era or which couple of years that democratic transitions take place, in which authoritarian rulers facing domestic and international pressure, surrender power, usually by peaceful means, some configuration of opposition forces takes their place, and then they inaugurate free, fair, and, com and competitive elections. Clearly, right, in 2010, obviously I start this before the Arab Spring, that, has, that wasn't happening in the Middle East, but again, if you look at representative cases elsewhere, right, Southern Europe, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, if I put Taiwan and South Korea in there, or Indonesia or the Philippines, it would show democratization in the uh, 1980s. This is to me, the, 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 the implication of this chart is that democracy indeed is historically absent in the Middle East relative to other regions, if by historical you mean 1973 or more recently. Before 1973, the modal regime type around the world was some kind of dictatorship. Right? If you were to look at the most frequent type or the average type of regime between 1900 and 1973, it would be some kind of non-democratic regime. So for the last 40 years, we've been living in a global era where there's been democratization except largely in the Middle East, which is where the impetus for this question comes from. Right? And this shows another, um, this is in 2013, this shows another Freedom House uh, presentation uh, regarding a map of functional electoral democracies. As you can see, uh, the extent of democracy isn't as well spread as some of us more normally inclined would like. We see some backtracking in Central America and South America. We see that swaths of the African continent, both uh, Sub-Saharan and Northern Africa, remaining non-electoral democracies 
In addition, we see much of the Middle East not remaining electoral democracies, with the exception of Tunisia, now relatively so in Israel. And finally, uh, China, much of the former Soviet Union, east of, uh, east of Central and Eastern Europe, and parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, some parts of the Caribbean Basin and uh, North Korea. Right. So when we ask ourselves, right, what is, you know, why can't democracy flourish in some parts of the Middle East or some parts of the world like the Muslim Middle East, at least this is my reaction when I teach this topic in classes, even at the graduate level, is that they say, well, you know, these people just aren't ready for democracy, right? And then I ask, what do you mean, these people? And then they usually say, you know, the, the Muslim people, right? Then I say, oh, so it's really the Muslim world which is problematic. And, you know, there, there, there are a lot of, obviously, cartoonish caricatures we can come up with this, but, you know, a, a lot of these images of certain places around the world, both within and around the Middle East, with a preponderance of a Muslim majority population, right? You know, these, these, I know it's really, I know Malaysia really is Reebok's problem or whatever, but, you know, and China has some really well-behaved Muslims, apparently. Um, uh, you know, many times we conflate a regime type or political order would say a predominant structural or cultural condition on the ground. And that is one thing that most of my research and much of the scholarship on, on uh, democracy in the Middle East has sought to foreclose, not because how people live or what religion they are or their personal identity doesn't matter. It most certainly does. But the best predictor of where democracy might end up or might emerge spontaneously through mass insurrection or popular uprising isn't necessarily right, their religious image or their cultural precondition or their civilizational heritage. If it was, then we wouldn't call Indonesia um, a democracy even, uh, but it is. It is the third largest democracy in the world and the largest um, Muslim country. Now, if we move from past to the future, right, that topic I just downgraded. The historical, comparative historical absence of democracy in the Middle East has obviously attracted a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, stream of research um, in, uh, you know, in my field of political science. And one thing that we know is that many of the explanations that we thought ex accounted for the durability or the persistence of dictatorship in the Middle East really just hit a brick wall starting in uh, December 2010 with the start of the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia, and that, uh, and, and that many of these explanations just didn't pan out. In other words, there was a disciplinary gut check that many political scientists had during, during the Arab uprisings in which many of us were forced to confront our assumption that you know, the Mubarak uh, Republican autocracy in Egypt would you know, go on and it would be impervious to change, and then Ali in Tunisia was the paragon of autocratic stability and institutional durability which was a chapter of my dissertation. So, you know, we, we, this really caught us by surprise. And, you know, certainly things are changing such that the answers to these questions will change. But a couple of more hard realities that we shouldn't forget about when we ask questions about regime type in the Middle East, despite the Arab uprisings, the modal regime type in the region still is some kind of authoritarianism from the eight monarchies to several surviving presidential or militaristic autocracies. We should also have some caution because the collapse of authoritarianism does not necessarily inaugurate a transition into democracy. If we were to compile a database starting from 1900 to the present day that would catalog every single transfer of power non-consensually from one rulership to another, by assassination, by overthrow, by uprising, by people power. More transitions happen between forms of authoritarianism than from authoritarianism into democracy. Right? And as an ongoing example, the Egyptian transition that's happening now, where I think that it's, it's ever evolving, right, 
what I would say it's happened in Egypt is that they had a nice transition, or more recently, from a presidential autocracy under the Mubarak era, a brief period of somewhat constrained pluralism, and then now they've backslid into some kind of militaristic autocracy. And it is a regime transition. Authoritarianism under Mubarak did collapse. It's just been replaced by a distinctive new or a different kind of autocratic order. Right? However, and this is something that I want to emphasize as well, that I'll get to later in the presentation, even under authoritarian conditions, we can find people who will speak in support of democratic values. And this is why we turn to other explanations for why democracy hasn't existed in the region, and if they can predict whether democracy will come to the region and say, the monarchies or the presidential and militaristic um, autocracies. Right. Now, if we look at survey findings, and pretty much now every large-scale survey organization, Pew, Gallup, and so forth, runs these kinds of surveys, public opinion polls, regularly. One of the more rigorous is the Arab Barometer, right, which is a project run by several political scientists. They've done several waves or clusters of surveys. These are results from the first wave, which were conducted in 2006 in these five uh, uh, national contexts, Morocco, Algeria, the Palestinian territories, Jordan, and Kuwait. And they asked respondents all sorts of questions about democracy, religion, and so forth. Now, the reason why I pull in results from 2006, even though there are more results coming in now, is that these were under conditions of authoritarianism. Right? In fact, the reason why they couldn't go to places like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, obviously, is that these countries didn't want Western researchers in their environs asking questions like, to each citizen, so, about this government of yours, not very democratic, huh? So what do we know, uh, you know, what can we extract from the results that they found from asking everyday citizens in these countries about, um, uh, about democracy? Well, what we know is that there's a lot of on-ground on support for the idea of democracy, right? 86% agreed that democracy was the best system of government. 90% believed that democratization in our country would be good. Now, nearly, there was a nearly 50-50 split on average of whether respondents believed men of religion should influence government decisions, i.e. an Islamic democracy versus secular democracy. Right? But the more important responses that many scholars found were in how if you divide up these two categories of people, those who believed in a government that should be influenced by men of religion, versus a government that should not be influenced by those wearing religious authority, we find virtually equal and consistent responses for similar democratic values, right? 95% of both samples, for instance, said it was important to have political leaders who are open to different political opinions. Between 70 and 76% of both populations suggested men and women should have equal job opportunities and wages, and 15% across the board only believe that having a strong leader who does not have to bother with parliament and elections would be good. So we know that at the microscopic level, it's not as if every citizen in these countries since 1973 have been you know, mobilizing in support of dictatorship. We know that at the microscopic level, there is considerable normative, moral, and even religious support for a government that, unlike the past, is more pluralistic, more competitive, and open to popular participation through electoral mechanisms, which leads to a couple of the most popular explanations for why democracy has been so lacking in the Middle East in the past. And as I run through these, I want to point out that you know, not only are these explanations for the historical absence of democracy controversial, even among scholars, but they may not offer much guidance to the future, depending on how much weight you put on these particular arguments. So the ease, I, I think the most common argument is that about economic development, that when you develop a country, it becomes wealthier as you generate higher levels of education, urbanization, and participation. The result is an empowered middle class that desires political voice, which is what some scholars say and analysts say we should be doing in China, not promoting democracy there, but promoting Chinese capitalism and development, because eventually the Chinese middle class will overthrow the communist regime on their own. And indeed, if you just looked at the Tunisian case, one would argue that Tunisia corroborates the hypothesis because it was one of the most middle class developed uh, you know, Arab states uh, in, in the entire region that lacked natural resource wealth. 
But there are a few problems with the argument that development or simply enriching the region might lead to democracy in the future. For one, we know that, and this will be an argument I present in just a minute, that some of the wealthiest states in the region are obviously some of the most undemocratic because how you would derive your wealth matters a lot for the kind of institutions you have in government. Right? Number two, we know that Egypt and Yemen were far less developed than Tunisia. And in fact, Yemen is one of the poorest countries in the entire region, but mass insurrections there also appended autocratic presidential regimes. Right? And we also know that lack of development did not impede the rise of electoral democracy in equally inhospitable contexts, from South Asia to the steppes of Central Asia, and finally to Sub-Saharan Africa. Which brings me to the oil curse, which many analysts believe is probably the most plausible reason or logic you can rely upon if you were to predict which regimes were to democratize next um, in the Middle East. Right? The argument about oil is that right, oil may be black gold, it may be instant money, easy money, as one scholar said, mana from heaven, since it seems to be just you, when, you, when you're blessed by the gods of geology and you have hydrocarbon wellsprings under your geological substrata, then you don't have to do a lot of things like tax your citizens. But as we found, this actually has very perverse effects for democracy. The so-called oil curse is that when you, you derive some or most of your revenues from oil exports, it distorts the relationship between governments, the government and citizens. And a crude inversion of the old revolutionary cry, we say that if there is no taxation, then no representation. Why? Because if you derive most of your resources from oil, you don't necessarily have to tax your citizens. But as we think theoretically, what is the trade-off for taxing citizens? The demand for political rights. Citizens who pay no taxes, according to this theory, demand no political rights, and why should they? They don't have to surrender the most important thing in a social contract between state and society, private property, right? their income, which even in democracies is an asset you surrender under threat of coercion. If you don't pay your taxes, the state will punish you. It's not a choice, it's an obligation. It is always an extractive, an extractive action backed by the threat of legal repression. When that's absent, then you don't necessarily have grassroots demands for democracy. In addition, large-scale oil revenues also give, um, you know, also give governments the, the capacity to buy large coercive apparatuses, weapons, tanks, and not just large-scale weaponry, because that's hard to deploy in a city unless you're you know, Qaddafi or, or Assad. Um, things like training your officers in anti-riot techniques in Western cities, for instance. That takes a lot of money, and that's what a lot, much of their military, much of their security budgets were spent on for much of the early, the, the mid-1990s to the early 2000s in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. Right? Now, we know that most oil-dependent Arab states match expected democratic, non-democratic outcomes. Algeria has oil, Oman has oil, Saudi Arabia has oil, and so forth, and they're not very democratic. We also know that you don't need oil to be an autocracy. We know this from Morocco and Jordan. We also know that the presence of oil wealth is no guarantee that the oil wealth will be spent wisely to please your citizens. We know this from Libya in 2012. We also know that non-Middle Eastern states with experience in oil revenue dependence have transited to democracy. Indonesia is the best example. And we also know that dependence upon other natural resources, which are like oil and that they replace taxation with revenue from abroad, like diamonds, have not impeded democracy everywhere like Botswana, which is singularly reliant upon the sale of super hardened you know, molecular carbon that we like to wear in our bodies and spend lots of money on, but they don't necessarily tax their citizens that much, but they're also one of the most democratic states in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, which brings me to the last part of my presentation and the third reason, and something I want to problematize. Many analysts, particularly in the mainstream media, but also just all across the political spectrum and the intellectual spectrum, then fall back on the international system. Geopolitics is why the Middle East has had a democratic deficit. Right? The argument is that, especially in the last 20 to 25 years, since the end of the Cold War, 
right? Western powers and international organizations have endorsed democracy in many regions of the world, except the Middle East, where strategic interests like oil, stability, Israel, anti-terrorism imperatives have countervailed the so-called impulse to promote democracy and key strategic allies like Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm going to go over why I think this is a highly problematic assumption in a bit, but first let me say that there are other reasons why we should be suspicious that regime outcomes on the ground, in other words, whether a country is, dem is democratic or not, is determined by what's happening outside the country short of a massive military invasion. Number one, we know that there are lots of states around the world in the Middle East that include Syria, which are pretty impervious to international norms. Like they'll do things like use chemical weapons, slaughter their citizens, not sign on to certain treaties, not have peace with Israel. And yet they don't see, you know, despite, West, you know, despite being outside this circle of Western strategic interests of not receiving much from the West, they endure, like Syria. We also know that if you look at the origins of the Arab uprisings, Western powers and international organizations played virtually no role in the initial wave of popular uprisings on the ground, which were generated from within. They, could, they facilitated them, and in Libya, they were crucial in enabling the toppling of the Gaddafi regime, right? But unless there's information that most of the public is not aware of, most of the individuals at the grassroots levels who began these spontaneous insurrections were not Western agents. They were not you know, activists from the UN. These were everyday citizens who didn't even belong to most political parties, including, in most cases, the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. Which is what I want to focus on now for uh, the final part of my presentation. Right? What is the American role? And how can we explain the future of democracy vis-a-vis -vis U.S. foreign policy? Which, again, like all questions, begs a critical assumption. What happens in U.S. foreign policy fundamentally determines the question or the answer to the question of democracy in the Middle East. Now, one thing that we find if we look at the history of, say, American interventions around the world and American debates about whether we should support this or that unsavory dictator is that both the intellectual and political left wing and right wing, I feel, misconstrue the extent to which the United States, by virtue of its profound economic and military powers, can shape the domestic politics of smaller countries. If you go back to 2003 and 4, when the Bush administration began talking about promoting democracy in places like Egypt and Jordan, or about the rhetoric now that we hear somewhat from Washington, debates about promoting democracy in the Middle East often boil down to this long-standing ideological dispute regarding the consequences of supporting or opposing authoritarian stability within the foreign policy establishment or community in Washington, DC. So this is the way the de debate typically goes. The left, right, including the center left and the far left left, I think, tend to argue that by propping up dictatorial allies, the US undermines democracy, they support human rights abuses, they perpetuate patterns of Western hegemony. So for instance, I read many analyses that essentially say Egypt before the January 2011 revolution was the product of American imperialism. Like, we did it. Now, I've also heard since the revolution from the right, including the far right, and this has been uh, particularly articulated in high places in the Senate by, uh, by, by, by several prominent voices, that it's actually America's fault that Egypt fell. Because by not propping up dictatorial allies, especially those facing regime-threatening crises, the U.S. has undermined its national stability, its security, destabilized the region, and hurt its reputation across the world. So, for instance, why did Mubarak fall during and after the January 2011 revolution? Because America abandoned him. Egypt and the Egyptian transition was the singular product of American betrayal. I find, obviously, both stories logically incompatible, and I also find them grounded only partially in reality. The reason why I think there are competing arguments about the role of U.S. foreign policy in terms of determining democracy abroad is the, mis is the misconception, or rather the ill-placed assumption, that the decisions made in Washington, short of invading and occupying a country, can dictate the outcome of something on the ground. Now, these debates were had, historically speaking, far outside the region for the past 50 or 60 years since America's ascent to be a superpower. They started really 
with the Kuomintang regime in China in 1948, when the bow lines became drawn in Washington that many people accused the Truman administration, the Truman administration lost China. Why? Because they didn't support the KMT enough against the communist rebels led by Zedong, and that's why we have China-Taiwan today. This came back in 1962 with the Kennedy administration and the Zhang regime in South Vietnam. We did not support the Zhang regime enough. We let him flounder. The Viet Cong became too strong, and by the late 60s, we were drawn to a full-scale counterinsurgency, essentially just a large-scale war, because we didn't do enough to prop up his militaristic dictatorship in the early 1960s so he could eradicate the Viet Cong operating in his country. Came up again in Nicaragua in 1978 with the Carter administration and the Somoza regime. Uh, you could say the same thing about Iran in the late 1970s as well, in which the Carter administration was accused of abandoning Nicaragua, abandoning the, 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 abandoning the Somoza dynasty in Nicaragua, or abandoning the Shah of Iran. And because of this American betrayal, these countries fell to mass mobilized people power movements that took these countries not always in the most positive directions. Now, I think the first thing to realize when we want to recalibrate the debate and with more humility ask ourselves how do we answer questions about democracy vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy is that to just concede that the U.S. matters a lot, but that doesn't mean the U.S. does everything. Short of outright intervention, U.S. foreign policy does not singularly dictate regime outcomes. If you were to correlate decisions made by presidential administrations to support or not support a regime that use non-militaristic devices, like diplomatic support, economic support, you wouldn't find a very strong correlational curve between those decisions and regime survival. Right? The Mubarak regime for the last 30 years didn't survive because of American support, but because it had a strategic coalition of Egyptian support. No regime can survive if it doesn't have domestic support. Otherwise, it would be killing everyone all the time to implement the simplest of laws. There is always a social base behind even the most rapacious of autocracies. Right? Likewise, nothing short of, I think, external military intervention would have demobilized the massive protests of January or February 2011. So hundreds of thousands went to Tahrir Square. There might have been millions of Egyptians who arose all over the place in those two very turbulent months, especially in those two weeks before Mubarak's departure. What possibly could the U.S. have done to prevent the toppling of an autocratic ally, short of sending in troops to kill or demobilize or arrest everyone who wanted Mubarak gone. Right. Now, another thing we find, and this is part of the, residence, the, the reticence, rather, that we many of us have against the projection of so-called military interventions for the sake of propping up a regime or implementing democracy, is that the US has done this quite a bit. The U.S. has projected military power abroad over 200 times since its founding. Only a minority, however, I'd say a minority, particularly in the last 100 years, involve the overthrow of government and the reconstruction of nation, or what we would call nation, or state building, or state rebuilding. Right? And this, I, this will be the last segment of my presentation, because this is inevitably, inevitably, I think, where debates about democracy and U.S. foreign policy go, uh, in terms of pre uh, predicting the future. All, these are the 16 cases that we know of in the last 100 years, and this was taken from a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace report, of U.S. nation-building exercises abroad. Right? Of these 16 cases, there was a minimal criteria. The U.S. had to invade, it had to occupy, and it had to overthrow a government and try to implement some government which was more democratic, i.e. more electoral, somewhat, than um, the previous one. Right? Now, if we go by a basic gauge, a benchmark of success, did they have democracy after 10 years? Then there are really only four successes. Japan, West Germany um, after World War II, and uh, Haiti and Panama after the late 1980s and mid-1990s. Um, I'm sorry, no, I'm reading it wrong. Panama and Granada. I, didn't think Haiti would be part of that. Granada and Panama, those two, um, you know, Granada being a very small Caribbean microstate, Panama being, you know, well, it's Panama. So the other cases haven't been very successful, right? And for a variety of reasons. And people have written entire books about this. This has been in congressional debates and 
you know, public debates, the U.S. doesn't know enough, the U.S. doesn't connect with locals, we're just not very good nation builders, and so forth. Regardless of our intentions, the historical record is that if we were to promote democracy in the Middle East, it probably shouldn't be through militaristic means. The historical record shows we're not very good at it. In fact, I think the best legacy of failed U.S. nation building is the American South after uh, the Civil War and American Reconstruction. The U.S. government toppled a nominally foreign sovereign government in place a more democratic one, or this in this case subsumed it, and tried to replace basic political and social institutions with more liberal ones. The legacy of that failure was Jim Crow and the civil rights movement a century later. So, you know, it's, it's hard to square some of these impulses to promote democracy with that historical record, precisely because if we look at the history of U.S. foreign policy, we actually find evidence throughout the last century that many a U.S. president has wanted to promote these ideals abroad, right? That the question of should the U.S. support democracy in X or Y region is a logical one. It's a natural one. It's one that Woodrow Wilson answered after World War I, right, with his call to decolonize the world. The idea that U.S. foreign policy should reflect its internal policies of liberalism and democracy for all. When FDR mobilized our massive war machine in World War II, in one of his most infamous phrases in his fireside chats, he called us the arsenal of democracy. That whether or not we had a choice, the U.S. had a moral obligation to safeguard democracy, not just at home, but, at a, but abroad as well. We know that Kennedy made numerous promises during the early Cold War period that we would support and embrace, and in other words, defend the frontiers of liberty, as he said in another speech, from communist incursions and aggression. We even heard this from the late Ronald Reagan when he argued that one of the policies, or at least implicit moral policies of the U.S. during the late Cold War should have been to foster or to promote democracy abroad. In his words, to foster the infrastructure of democracy, the system of a free press, unions, political parties, universities, which allows the people to choose their own way. So there are resonances of some kind of impulse or imperative to promote democracy abroad in the history of U.S. foreign policy. Even though we know the U.S. may not be particularly good at it, there seems to be an, an overriding historical, historical impulse for it, which again, has to go up against the historical conditions that we've seen in the region that militate against democracy spreading overnight, right? What are non-coercive means of promoting democracy if we, as the U.S., step back from the militaristic nation-building exercises? There are really two means, pressure and assistance. Pressure, the U.S. can weaken dictatorships through nonviolent sanctions and threats, or incentivize reforms through diplomatic and economic carrots. Current examples, uh, most of which are absolute failures, are Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Burma has actually turned the corner, which is an astounding and I think a very, hopefully, optimistic success in the coming years. Now, this kind of strategy, if you were to put democracy promotion as a U.S. Uh, imperative in the coming years in the Middle East would mean, okay, so we punish Saudi Arabia if they don't, say, let women drive. Or we punish Jordan if, say, the next elections aren't completely free and fair and there's no constitutional monarchy that the Hashemite family of that, uh, the ruling Hashemite dynasty of that country implements in the next 15 years. That would be the logical uh, extension of that imperative. Or we could assist, and this means working with actors on the ground, giving opposition forces resources and knowledge. And I think the best example of this is what we did in Central Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? which I think all of our students share in common that they weren't living when that happened, which is really scary. Um, U.S. support for these new democracies entailed electoral monitoring, funding new political parties, you know, training new independent judges, supporting civil society, financing and training you know, journalists to be independent watchdogs of the state. Now, the reason why these non coercive means of promoting democracy are hard to imagine in the Middle East, much as my hypotheticals against Saudi Arabia and Jordan were somewhat unrealistic, is because historically, genuine turns against authoritarian allies are rare and relatively short-lived. And because of that, American efforts to suddenly promote democracy in certain states that have long been authoritarian allies are seldom seen as credible or consistent. There is a reason why the Bush administration 
for three years, was the most aggressive promoter of democracy in the Middle East, outside of Iraq, through non-coercive means that we'd seen since the Kennedy administration. There's an equally important reason why they suddenly quit in 2006. Right? When the Bush administration, or the Reagan, late Reagan administration, then the early Bush administration, turned against Panama in the late 1980s, we did everything under the sun to get Noriega out of Panama. We sent in the Navy SEALs and the U.S. Army because we had exhausted all non coercive means. Our efforts to promote democracy with Noriega just weren't credible. Right? Which brings me to a couple of key takeaway points when we try to square the historical context of the Middle East the concept of democracy and the non-negotiables that have to be existent for democracy to occur in a particular place or time, as well as the role of U.S. foreign policy. It's a lot to digest, and I think the many of our some of I think the public's confusion about this duly reflects the difficulty of mediating these policy debates in Washington. The fact that the U.S. just hasn't been very good at articulating a consistent stance on democracy in the Middle East is evidence of that. Now, one takeaway point and safe assumption that we can, I think many of us can agree on, the possibility of further uprisings in the Arab world, drawing upon many of the theoretical insights I delivered, does not hinge entirely upon American foreign policy, which could be said to be the supply side of the democracy equation. The demand side matters too. The Egyptian revolution happened not because of, I think, anything the US did, but because hundreds of thousands of Egyptians took to the streets because Hassan Mubarak repressed too many people, and because Egyptian military generals didn't follow orders to slaughter them on the spot. Number two, the structural and historical conditions that impede democracy, such as repression and the oil curse, they evolve under their own dynamics. There is a reason why many of us didn't predict the Arab uprisings. Well, the first reason is that political scientists, much like government analysts, can't predict anything really well. <laughs> but secondly, it's because Many of these dynamics are linked to historical patterns, and they're just difficult to predict because these are macroanalytic concepts. We talk about the oil curse. How do we know whether the oil markets will boom or bust in 7.5 years, and whether a government will institute a new welfare policy or oppressive policy in those intervening, say, you know, seven or eight years? We just don't know. What we do know is that based upon these historical conditions and the debates happening within the context of US foreign policy, there are some safe predictions we can make. Number one, for the immediate future, and this is something that I hope none of us forget because this is extremely important, something that is often forgotten in the optimistic hubbub, and it should remain optimistic, right? Most of us believe in democracy, but still, the reality is the modal regime type in the Middle East is some kind of authoritarianism. In other words, the you know, the most typical kind of government in the region is one that does not allow for free and fair elections. For all the spring that happened among the Arab uprisings, the winter of their discontent is still present in many of these states. However, a somewhat safe bet would be that it is quite likely that further democratic transitions will just transpire over the next decade. We don't know where, but it's likely that what's happened now won't stop, but it won't be because of US foreign policy. Right? And it may reflect this structural and historical con conditions that have impeded democracy in the past, but that may end in the next five or 10 years. What we do know is that every scholar under the sun between the, late the mid 1990s and the late 2000s wrote shelves and shelves of volumes of work that said authoritarianism was durable, unstoppable, stable, and just impervious to democratic pressures from below in the Middle East. Many of their key case studies were Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and Yemen and Bahrain and Syria. So predictions of authoritarian durability probably don't hold a lot of um, water. A safer bet would be Yes, we'll probably see more democratic transitions, but out of the desire for democracy on the ground up and reflection of structural and historical conditions and not necessarily because of what the U.S. says or does. Thank you. We'll take questions now. Here. Uh, 
I was looking at a new book last month, Democracy and Retreat. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It was discussing the kind of the reemergence of authoritarianism in so much of the developing world and that, um, that the trends from the third wave are actually in reverse across, and it, it was really kind of a cross-regional comparison. It was pretty gloom and doom. Um, do you think the main factor is that civil liberties are not guaranteed? So many of the democratic movements have been illiberal rather than liberal, and is that the key problem? I think that there are two, uh, I think that there are two um, factors. Uh, inter I'm sorry, is this on still? It doesn't sound on. Is it? Oh. It's now on. Yes, okay. I think there are uh, two, uh, two reasons why we've seen what you know, we would call democratic backsliding in a lot of developing countries which have seen transitions. One is that you're absolutely right. Many opposition movements aren't very liberal. Right? And I'm including not just certain opposition movements which may be motivated uh, by religious identity or religious fervor, but also those who simply have ideological or organizational values which just aren't very friendly to, de uh, to democracy. Uh, we see this in some parts of Africa, for instance, as well as some parts of Asia. But I think a second factor, an equally important factor, is that autocrats have just gotten a lot better at stopping transitions and, and, and cloaking authoritarian institutions and democratic rhetoric. And all it takes and, you know, to, to really kill a democracy is one election where a demagogue wins power, subverts constitutional rule of law, and then continues the language of democracy but not the spirit. And we call these regimes competitive authoritarian regimes. Right? Competitive because it's not like Syria where you go to the ballot box and you know, it's like, who are you going to do you like Bashar to stay in office? And the answers are yes and yes. And then it also says, please sign your name, number, and address here. <laughs> right? There are regimes around the world which are not democratic that actually have elections which are reasonably transparent. And they let international observers even come and watch. But there's just enough flexing of the muscle, just enough manipulation, just enough massaging of results that the incumbent always wins. This has been the case in a number of sub-Saharan African and some Central Asian states. Um, Venezuela became like this under Chavez. Zimbabwe became like this under Mugabe. Belarus under Lukashenko. It's just a pretty widespread phenomenon. Any more questions? Well, if we don't have oh, one more from Walter McDougall. Thank you. That was a great presentation. It was thoroughly persuasive to me. How on earth can you get the American people and uh, its leaders, its elected leaders, uh, to, uh, to uh, understand uh, and act on uh, your very prudent advice? <laughs> In other words, we've had, we've, had a couple of, we've had a couple of speakers saying you know, that democracy promotion and crusading and uh, and foreign interventions uh, are in our DNA. We, well, they're in our DNA. We can't do anything about it. Uh, we think we're a democracy. We think we govern ourselves, but we really don't. It's in our DNA. And somehow our brains are hardwired for this kind of uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Certainly throughout history, as you pointed out, you can see uh, this, this phenomenon, at least from Wilson, I would take it back to McKinley, yeah. uh, up to the present. Yeah. Um, it, it, we repeatedly uh, go off on these crusades. Um, and uh, we fail, and uh, then we do it again 20 years, 15, 10 years later. Uh, do you have any, you know, I'm, not, I'm not, asking, not asking you as a political scientist, I'm asking you as an American citizen. You have this insight. Um, you understand the politics of the Middle East very, in a very sophisticated way, and, uh, and you, want to, you want to have this knowledge bear on the policies of our leaders, whether they're Democratic or Republican. Do you have any hope to do that in your career, young man? <laughs> First of all, thank you for calling me young. That's great. That's great. I'm not as young as I look. And secondly, the answer is no. Next question. No. Um, um, no, I mean, that my flippant response would be, don't ask me. I'm a professor. What do I know? Um, but then I tell this to my students and then say, oh, okay, well, we shouldn't do well in your class. And I say, no, no, I know everything. I'm your professor. Please come to class and listen to me lecture and pay that tuition money. No, um, the, the, my honest answer just as a citizen is that, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, there are grassroots ways to, I think, influence U.S. foreign policy. But one of the 
one of the reasons why it's so difficult to do it consistently is that the very strength of American democracy is the weakness of its foreign policy. You know, by definition, no foreign policy establishment will remain consistent for longer than four or eight years because that's the length of a presidential tenure. When presidents come in and out, they replace key staff, National Security Council, key de under secretaries and secretaries of cabinets. Uh, they replace key diplomatic personnel, ambassadors, and so forth. And it's very hard to maintain consistency, which also means that it's very hard to remember from failures in the past. Right. So I'll give you an example. Um, it just boggled my mind that, you know, part, that, that, that the Bush administration in uh, the, early, the, the early to mid-2000s in Iraq signed off on the order to disband and liquidate not just the Ba'ath Party, but the Iraqi army under the idea that they were all part of the old or the order, they couldn't take part in the new one. Uh, we didn't do this in Japan or uh, Germany after World War II. And one of the key personnel who was you know, a key figure in the Bush administration, very well-respected political scientist, Condoleezza Rice, who's now back at Stanford, very nice woman and very pu well-published in her own right in the 1980s, became one of the first African-American women to ever earn tenure at Stanford, actually, in the early 80s. She cut her teeth writing about Soviet military strategy and potential change in Central Eastern Europe. And if you go back to her early work, she's actually arguing that if we were to ever see ideological change or revolutions in Central Eastern Europe, we should not you know, unilaterally liquidate and disband the Communist Party and everyone connected to it, including the military, because in a single party state and in a militaristic structure, you know, they don't really have a choice. So it just boggled my mind that that could happen under her watch under the Bush administration. And I think that there are a lot of externalities to, why, to, to that particular action in Iraq. That's why I think it's so difficult, because people forget. The, the foreign policy establishment of this country doesn't have good institutional memory. If it did, I think our foreign policy would be radically different. What I tell my students, um, when they're not you know, putting status updates on Facebook <laughs> and tweeting about my class and I don't know, do, doing all sorts of social media things in class, um, is uh, you know, I try to give them historical perspective. And I just say, you have to start from the ground up. It's difficult with, I think, students today because I made a remark during my presentation how they're so young, right? You know, I, I was born in, I'm in, my, I'm in my early 30s, and so I lived through the end of the Cold War. I remember the Gulf War. I get students now at university. These are honor students who are top notch and they're going to do great things in the world. And I'm teaching about the second Gulf War, and they raise their hand. They're like, excuse me, what was the first Gulf War? And I talk about how we invaded Iraq for a second time. They're like, when was the first? Like, where are you talking about? We were there before. <laughs> like, it's only the mother of all battles, according to Saddam Hussein, in 1990. But it's, it's, you know, I give them historical perspective, and I just say, you just have to, you know, I mean, I think the simplest way is to write tons and tons of letters to congressmen and senators. And I know that sounds like a tried and true strategy, but one thing that I know about the way that my students often go into politics or into research and so forth is that they start small. They may not necessarily end up in a big place, but you know, when the dust settles and if, they re if we realize that the U.S. has made a very bad decision overseas, even though history has told us how to avoid it and we've done everything in our power to avoid that mistake, but we couldn't stop it, at least we did something. Right? Well, on that note, <laughs> I think we will... And our, uh, oh, we have one more question? Okay, so we'll take one more question and then closing remarks from Alan. It, it was a, a wonderful presentation, brilliant presentation. I, it was a del delight to hear and I thank you for it. Uh, just two small points. On the, on the Carnegie map, the Philippines is missing. Maybe that's because it's more than 100 years ago, I'm not sure, but when you towed up you know, the, the, the number of hypothetical successes of kinetic interventions, the Philippine goes into the wind column so it's, it's, not a, it's not one to forget, you know, on the charts. You can't trust Carnegie all the time, though. You make your own charts. The other, the other, the other small comment is that you, you went through the, uh, the, uh, uh, po uh, the polling data, the opinion data, without, uh, without side comment on it. And uh, in my experience, the closer you look at the methodologies um, with which that data is collected, the more skeptical you are that it actually means anything at all. Uh, if you look at the translations into Arabic of the questions written by English-speaking people, uh, translations of the word religion, uh, translations of the word democracy. Democracy is not a word that has an Arabic root. It's democracia. Um, you have to make a lot of assumptions uh, in interpreting that data in order to come to the conclusion 
that uh, the people of this region understand democracy and want democracy the way that most of us think about it. So I'm very skeptical uh, of using that, that polling data without a lot of caveats and, uh, and asterisks. Yeah. Well, um, as to your first point, you're absolutely right. That, that chart started, it's a Carnegie chart, it starts at 1900. So <laughs> if it went back four years, I'm sure they would have included the Philippines. So um, yeah, I know what they were thinking. Uh, the, the, the second point, I absolutely agree that, you know, I, so I don't do public opinion polls or surveys myself. That wasn't my methodology when I went through graduate school. So I just, I put a lot of trust in what other people find. Um, I share your skepticism because I've seen some pretty awful Arabic translations of English texts as well, of questions that researchers, oftentimes they're fresh-faced doctoral students on their first overseas field grant that they're asking people. And there's like, oh, I'm getting all these kind of intuitive answers is because like the, the respondents don't understand what they're asking them and they're just saying anything. But, but what I want to point out is that whether it's Gallup or Pew or Arab Barometer or other surveys, I mean, I, I think one indisputable fact is that for whatever they were thinking of, whatever, whatever kind of government they think is best, what we do know is that in at least a few of these countries, the status quo, the incumbent one, wasn't their favorite. Right? And so I think that's indisputable. Whether or not a more liberal or democratic one is their real priority, Again, I mean, that's going to be a question which, going back to one of my themes, will be determined regardless of what we think, right? But it should be something that I think we're going to observe very carefully. I think some of these countries in a liberal democracy might form. Some of these countries, liberal democracies might form. Or some of these countries will just see backsliding all over the place, various kinds of militaristic autocracies reemerging, which is exactly what happens in any region when you have this kind of transformation. Central Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, you have Indonesia being a democracy, Malaysia being a single party state, and Vietnam still being Vietnam. So I think we're going to see that variation. It's important to, as you point out, not to put everything in the same category. It's very important to note the diversity. Thank you. That was excellent.